This episode of the EV Resource Podcast is brought to you by Titan Auto and Tire. Titan has some of the very few independent auto repair shops in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids. And from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, go to TitanAutoTire.com. Coming up this week, Ford steps up their EV efforts. Biden announces financial help for GM. Rivians get more range and more. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 133 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. As always, I've got a packed show for you, but before we get to the news, I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to subscribe or follow this podcast on your podcast player. That way you'll get all the future episodes delivered to you automatically, and you don't have to go searching for them week after week. It is completely free, so there is absolutely no charge, and I definitely would recommend that you do that. Also, I'm making YouTube a big focus for the coming year, so I want to ask all of you, if you would, go watch a couple of the videos that I have up, not the podcast ones, because of course it's on audio only, but uh, the other videos, and give me some feedback. I wanna know what you like, what you don't like, what you would recommend. Basically, my goal is to make the best YouTube videos that I can and really grow that side of things along with the podcast. And I have a couple of goals for YouTube, but I'll save those for the end of the podcast so that we can get right to the news. First up is a pair of stories about Ford. The company has made EVs a big focus for its brand, and it's showing. With a celebratory air, Ford released a statement announcing that the new F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck can now add the prestigious 2023 Motor Trend Truck of the Year award to its trophy case. The win sets a precedent. The F-150 Lightning is the first electric truck to win by a unanimous vote among the judges. It's also only the second time an electric vehicle has won unanimously in the history of Motor Trend's Vehicle of the Year competitions. That's pretty impressive. Darren Palmer, vice president of electric vehicle programs, said, quote, It's really brilliant for the team that Lightning is the first EV truck to win by unanimous vote. This truck is full of firsts, and this one is really special to the to add to the Lightning's historic launch, end quote. The F-150 Lightning earned the title of America's best-selling electric truck in November, with sales totaling 2,062 units. Since the truck was introduced in May, sales have totaled 13,258 units, and the success of the Lightning has contributed to Ford being the number two EV brand in the U.S. year-to-date, which I mentioned last week. Ed Lowe, Motor Trend's group head of editorial, said, quote, The F-150 Lightning and its nearly insistent torque with ride and handling make it without a doubt the best truck Ford has ever made. If that feels like a bold statement, consider that among our judges, the F-150 Lightning won truck of the year by unanimous decision, the first EV truck to convince all judges across the board. The F-150 Lightning is no less than a milestone achievement in the history of American mobility, end quote. Ford ends the press release saying that they are ramping up quickly to deliver 150,000 Lightning trucks by the end of next year, and that Ford's electric vehicle business is growing with a conquest rate of over 60%. And that means that over 60% of their buyers are coming from other brands. That is very significant. And a little information about the methods that Motor Trend uses To earn the Motor Trend honor, each contender is put through a standard battery of acceleration tests along with figure eight handling and 60 to zero braking performance tests. The trucks are also subject to additional class relevant tests such as accelerating and braking with a trailer weighing near its rated capacity and ballasted to near the payload capacity. Judges also conduct a frustration test, as they call it, of highway acceleration uphill with a trailer. In addition, individual judges conduct their own subjective off-road tests on a variety of road types and surfaces. And even with all that, the F-150 still won with a unanimous vote. That's really impressive, and I want to give a huge congratulations to the company and the entire team that has worked so hard on the F-150 Lightning. And Ford has also been making some changes in order to keep up with demand for the F-150 Lightning. The company has now added a third shift at its Detroit assembly plant where the truck is made. 
Ford initially planned to build a second facility near its Rouge facility in Dearborn, Michigan, to produce around 40,000 Lightning EVs annually. However, the overwhelming early demand pushed Ford to expand the factory by about 78,000 square feet instead of that second facility to streamline production and boost output here. The automaker looks to raise output again as competition in the EV market continues growing. Ford has said it added a third shift at its Rouge Electric Vehicle Center, adding roughly 250 employees to increase production of the Lightning pickup. Ford's facility is now running seven days a week with crews alternating 10-hour shifts. The additional shift comes as Ford strives to reach 150,000 units annual capacity by the end of 2023. Corey Williams, plant manager at the Rouge facility, says Ford is on track to hit that threshold even with an expansion taking place. So big things going on at Ford. However, in my mind, I'm never satisfied with any company, and I find myself being really curious about what other EV models Ford has in the plans. Come on, I want more. Looks like I'm going to have to settle for more of the F-150 Lightning units, and that is still great. Uh, While I have not driven the truck, I have seen them up close and taken a close, close look, and I was really impressed. So uh, I would agree, it is the best truck that Ford has ever made. Next, Panasonic has signed a deal to supply EV batteries to Lucid Group. The company has been seeking to expand its customer base, and according to Kazuo Tadonobu, head of Panasonic's energy business, he said, quote, Partnerships with technology-leading EV manufacturers such as Lucid are critical to our mission, end quote. Currently, nearly all of Panasonic's automotive battery production goes to Tesla as the leading U.S. EV maker rapidly expands output, while Panasonic, which plans to build a new $4 billion battery plant in Kansas, is benefiting from that ballooning demand. Officials at the Japanese company are also wary about relying too heavily on only one customer, which makes sense. Obviously, you want to spread out a little bit. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, as it were. Peter Rollinson, Lucid's CEO and CTO, said, quote, Panasonic is a fantastic partner with both innovative technology and depth of experience. This agreement will help us meet the growing demand for lithium-ion batteries as we continue to ramp production of the full Lucid Air lineup in 2023 and expect to begin production of our Gravity SUV in 2024, end quote. And there was no indication in any of the press release that I saw about the amount of batteries to be supplied, or if Lucid would also continue with other suppliers as well. Personally, I'd love to get those details, but I can only assume that maybe those details have still yet to be decided. If there is any update on this that I happen to come across, I'll let you know. Next, Toyota seems to be making a course correction with its EV intentions. After seeing the success and demand automakers like Tesla and BYD are having with electric vehicles, Toyota is reportedly looking to grab its share. Toyota is set to make significant adjustments to its EV strategy in its upcoming meeting with suppliers next year. And anyone following this podcast for a while by now knows that Toyota has been significantly lagging when it comes to full battery electric vehicles, and that has been by choice. Up until recently, Toyota has stuck by its hybrid technology, or as the automaker's CEO, Akio Toyota, recently put, quote, playing with all the cards in the deck, end quote. The company has been highly critical of embracing fully electric vehicles and, as a result, consistently ranks among the worst in decarbonization efforts. Despite this, the industry is moving forward with electric vehicle pioneers like Tesla, which is generating record sales and demand. Perhaps more importantly, Toyota has taken an interest in the manufacturing efficiencies that have led Tesla to post industry high margins as much as 27.9% in the third quarter. In fact, Tesla is now earning eight times more per car than Toyota is. Although Toyota revealed its plan to bring 30 battery electric vehicles globally by 2030, the company has reportedly been considering a strategy overhaul to better compete. Toyota is planning to have its first major meeting with suppliers this coming February, its first meeting since the global pandemic and lockdown, and significant changes are expected to be proposed. According to the report from Reuters, Toyota is expecting to outline adjustments to its electric vehicle strategy to key suppliers early next year as it races to narrow the gap on price and performance with industry leaders Tesla and BYD, two people with knowledge of the work said. 
The leading Japanese automaker is expected to detail the EV plan changes through early 2026, communicating the adjustments to major suppliers, the people said on condition of anonymity, as the information is confidential. The people also said Toyota has been looking at ways to improve the competitiveness of EVs being planned for this decade, in part by speeding up the adoption of performance-boosting technologies for planned vehicles, from electric drive systems, including motors, to the electronics that convert power from the grid to energy stored in batteries, and more integrated heating and cooling systems. The changes, however, might include delays to some of the EV development programs originally planned for the three-year period. In an official statement, Toyota responded saying that it is, quote, always actively discussing and working with key suppliers and partners on a variety of topics, end quote, to achieve carbon neutrality. But it said it had no new details to disclose on EV development projects. Surprise, surprise. Toyota has been reviewing a $30 billion three-stage plan for developing and releasing EVs it announced late last year, Reuters reported in October. It has suspended work on some battery-powered projects announced last year, while a working group headed by former chief competitive officer Shigaki Tarashi looks to improve cost, performance, and technology in the fast-growing market for EVs. The working group has been charged with outlining plans to improve Toyota's EV approach, including considering a potential new successor to its new EV platform, the ETNGA. The revamp comes even as Toyota holds the view that gasoline electric hybrids, a market it has pioneered with the Prius, will remain a crucial part of the transition to carbon neutral transport. However, most major automakers and myself expect that full battery electric vehicles will account for the majority of vehicle sales by 2030, and green investors and environmental groups have been pushing Toyota to move faster as industry-wide EV sales exceed Toyota's earlier assumptions. So is this the beginning of the major EV takeover we've all been expecting from Toyota? Or will it be too little too late as other brands were quicker to the punch? Personally, I expect Toyota to be a dominant player in the EV space as soon as they decide that's what they want to do. And maybe, just maybe, reports like this are an indication that they are shifting their focus to do just that. Next, President Joe Biden has announced a $2.5 billion loan to help GM and LG make EV batteries because, you know, they're leading the EV space, right? Okay, jokes aside, I am going to try to get through this news story without too many snide comments. The U.S. Department of Energy's loan programs office announced that it is issuing a $2.5 billion loan to help start three lithium battery manufacturing hubs one in Ohio, one in Tennessee, and the third in Michigan. The DOE Loan Programs Office will loan the money to Ultium Cells LLC, which is the joint venture between GM and LG Energy Solutions. In a statement, U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm said the DOE loan would, quote, jumpstart the domestic battery cell production needed to reduce our reliance on other countries to meet increased demand. DOE is flooring the accelerator to build the electric vehicle supply chain here at home. And that starts with domestic battery manufacturing led by American workers and the unions that support them, end quote. In President Biden's first year in office, he set a target to have EVs make up half of all new vehicle sales in the U.S. by 2030. And after the climate law Congress passed this summer, auto companies are racing to start onshoring electric vehicle production. In order to take advantage of the federal EV tax subsidy in the Inflation Reduction Act, EVs and much of their battery components have to be sourced, processed, and assembled here in North America. LG Energy Solutions is also set to partner with Japanese automaker Honda on a $3.5 billion joint venture battery factory in Southern Ohio. But as far as I can tell, there's no information that suggests that this loan from the DOE is intended to help with that. In October, Biden introduced the American Battery Materials Initiative, which the White House has called a new effort to mobilize the entire government in securing a reliable and sustainable supply of critical minerals used for power, electricity, and electric vehicles. At the time, the administration pledged $2.8 billion from the bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year to 20 manufacturing and processing companies for projects in 12 states. The DOE estimates that three Ultium cell factories would create over 11,000 jobs. The Warren, Ohio Ultium facility will be represented by the UAW after the plant voted to unionize on Friday. 
So what confuses me here is that the administration pledged $2.8 billion for 20 manufacturing and processing companies for projects in 12 states. But $2.5 billion of this is a loan to only one company and three projects. So does that leave $0.3 billion or what is that, $300 million for the rest of 19 companies in nine other states? I don't know. This is confusing. I feel like I'm definitely missing something. So I'm going to keep my mouth mostly shut on this. A um, lot of unanswered questions. But generally, I do support the EV efforts from GM as they seem to be really focused on making affordable EVs. And naturally, as a part of that, I'm going to support the uh, efforts to subsidize that to a point, at least for now, uh, while we're still early on all of this. But this whole story really reeks of corruption and cronyism. And while I'm not going to get political, the idea of government choosing to support one company while all but ignoring the others really disgusts me. Let's come up with solutions that prop up the EV industry as a whole, like what people say they're going to do, instead of playing favorites. And of course, that just assumes that playing favorites is what is happening, which like I said, maybe I'm missing something. I don't know, but it certainly reads like that on its face. Next, according to a report from GM Authority, Chevy brand president Mark Roos revealed that the company is working on an EV that will feature sedan-like proportions, and possibly it could make it into the lineup here in North America as a Malibu replacement or successor. However, things are still early for this, and the Malibu replacement has currently only been confirmed for the Chinese market, where sedans are still in high demand. Here in the States, we definitely tend to prefer our crossovers, SUVs, and trucks. Chevy recently debuted an electric sedan concept for China called the FNRXE, based on the Ultium platform. The overall shape is similar to the Honda EN2 concept, and that makes sense because Honda and GM are already collaborating on electric vehicles, with the Chevy Blazer EV and Honda Prologue sharing the same underpinnings. So we've definitely got some time before this becomes a reality, as is common with most GM product announcements. The Malibu's potential all-electric replacement will debut for the Chinese market at the end of 2024. So U.S. sales, if GM does decide to bring it here, likely wouldn't start till at least 2025. Next, owners of Rivian's R1T and R1S have received an early Christmas gift from the company. Earlier this week, Rivian released a big software update for its R1T electric truck and R1S electric SUV, delivering a new snow mode and several other enhancements. The December update added the option to preheat the second row seats and futon, heat the steering wheel, and remotely turn on defrost. Snow mode relaxes the throttle response and improves cold weather driving, and it sounds like Rivian made several upgrades to the battery and regenerative braking system through software. As a result, both the truck and SUV now have higher estimated ranges. In the official Rivian R1T and R1S version 2022.47 log, Rivian mentions improved battery longevity, battery durability, and regenerative braking performance, enhanced regen availability, and you can use regen for longer durations. An eagle-eyed Rivian fan on Reddit noticed that along with the update, Rivian changed the online configurator with higher mileage estimates this week. For example, the Rivian R1T with all-wheel drive and the large battery pack went from 314 miles to an estimated 328 miles, an increase of 14 miles per charge. It's also similar for the Rivian R1S, which went from 316 miles to 321. Interestingly enough, the SUV didn't jump as much as the truck, but hey, take what you can get, right? And this is just something that's really cool with EVs or really any software over the air update capable vehicle. You can have a car and it can get improved after you've already bought it. That's something that Tesla is very well known for. And it's super exciting to see that that is becoming an industry standard. OK, and the last news I have for you this week is about Foxconn and Lordstown Motors. Foxconn has agreed to invest up to $170 million in Lordstown Motors to develop a new EV. And this is good news because Lordstown Motors would likely cease to exist without this support. 
In a statement from Lordstown Motors, they explain some of the troubles they've been having and also details about the partnership. It says, quote, the funding transactions under the investment agreement are subject to closing conditions, including regulatory approvals and further negotiation of development milestones. The EV program will require additional funding and the establishment and implementation of the program requirements, among other matters, and may not be consummated, sufficiently implemented, or provide the benefits we expect, which could have a material adverse effect on our business, operating results, financial conditions, and prospects. The success of the EV program depends on many variables, which could include our ability to utilize the designs, engineering data, and other foundational work of Foxconn, its affiliates, and other members of the MIH consortium, as well as other parties to commercialize, industrialize, homologate, and certify a vehicle in North America, along with variables that are out of the party's control, such as technology, innovation, adequate funding, supply chain, and other economic conditions, competitors, consumer demand, and other factors that impact new vehicle development. If we are unable to develop new vehicles for ourselves and potentially other customers, our business prospects, results of operations, and financial condition may be adversely affected. If the investment transactions are consummated, Foxconn will own a significant percentage of our equity securities and have rights that enable it to influence our actions, operation of the board, and actions requiring stockholder approval. If we are unable to maintain our relationship with Foxconn or effectively manage outsourcing the production of the endurance to Foxconn, we may be unable to ensure continuity, quality, and compliance with our design specifications or applicable laws and regulations, which may ultimately disrupt and have a negative effect on our production and operations. We will need additional funding and will seek strategic partnerships to execute our business plan and to achieve scaled production of the endurance and development of other vehicles. There can be no assurance that such financing or partnerships will be available to us on favorable terms or at all due to several factors, including market and economic conditions, the significant amount of capital required, the fact that our bill of materials cost is currently and expected to continue to be substantially higher than our anticipated selling price, uncertainty surrounding regulatory approval and the performance of the vehicle, meaningful exposure to material losses related to ongoing litigation and the SEC investigation, our performance and investors' sentiment with respect to us and our business and industry. Phew, that was a lot. So it looks like Lordstown Motors is slowly becoming a subsidiary of Foxconn, which honestly, that would not be a bad thing. What this also shows is that Foxconn is very confident about the future of the EV industry and believes there is something valuable within Lordstown Motors that they are willing to invest. However, that forward-looking statement from Lordstown Motors is not very optimistic. It basically is saying that the chance of failure is significant, uh, and maybe that's just a legal document and they are required to, to put that out there, but after reading that, I really don't feel that optimistic about uh, what they're going to be able to do. Um, I wish them all the success and, and certainly to both companies, both Lordstown and Foxconn. Um, and I hope that they can find a way to make this work because uh, while the Lordstown endurance certainly is a little uh, different from other EV trucks, I do think it has a place in the market and especially for fleets because that's really what they're targeting. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Hopefully keep your fingers crossed that they can make something work. Okay, so that is the end of the news segment for this week, but stick around. There's much more to come right after this. Do you own a business and want to reach EV owners and people interested in electric vehicles? EV Resource is welcoming businesses nationwide, both big and small, to become advertising partners with us across all platforms. The EV Resource podcast, magazine, YouTube videos, social media, and our webpage. For more information, please email Zach at hello at ev-resource.com. Okay, now it is time to feature our question of the week. Last week, I asked you what you all thought about GM spinning off Corvette as its own brand in order to make multiple Corvette EV models, including a four-door sedan and an SUV. We had a mixed response to this one, unsurprisingly. Rajiv Narayan favored the idea, saying, quote, Chevrolet holds a mass-market brand position. 
While the Corvette has been moving up market for some time, and even more so since it went to a mid-engine configuration, it makes sense then for Corvette to leave the Chevy brand. A standalone Corvette brand would make more sense as it doesn't really fit into any of the other GM brands, end quote. And Christopher Lawrence disagrees, saying, quote, This is what happens when somebody brings a flare gun into the boardroom and touches it off. Yes, you see something bright and shiny, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. This has new coke written all over it. Did they even walk outside and ask 100 people on the street, what vehicle do you think of when you hear the word Chevrolet? In my opinion, Corvette, Silverado, Suburban, and Camaro are all cornerstones of the brand. To me, an exile of Corvette from the Chevy brand is akin to the muddled thinking that adding a U to the name badge creates a completely new vehicle. End quote. And that last bit is a nod to the Bolt EV and EUV naming mess. And while Chris did go on to apologize to any Bolt owners who might take offense to that, I don't. Chevy has seriously messed up their naming for the EVs, and I still run into lots of people that are confused about the Volt with the V versus the Bolt with the B, and now the confusion between Bolt EV and EUV is added to the mix. It is a disaster. But to get back on track here, I actually can see uh, some merit to both arguments. Chris is looking at the past and highlighting the legacy of Chevrolet and what that name means to people. And Rajiv is looking at the future based on the progression of the Corvette's technology and value. To me, Chevy means cheap cars, both in price as well as build quality. And I say that owning a Chevy, so it's not like I'm just pulling that out of my butt. But Corvette, on the other hand, is one vehicle that I don't feel like it falls into that category. So I'm all about separating the brand Corvette separate from Chevy. But to me, Corvette also means high-powered sports car. It doesn't mean four-door sedan or SUV. But of course, as I say that, Mustang never meant four-door SUV, and Porsche and Lamborghini didn't mean that either. Yet here we are with all of those offerings available to buy today. I think GM could go either way here, but building a Corvette SUV and four-door sedan will likely piss off more people than it's worth, as opposed to just introducing new EV models and having them named something different. Anyway, enough on that. For this week's question of the week, I want to go back and touch on Toyota. It looks like Toyota is starting to shift focus and put more effort into building full battery electric vehicles in the coming years. So do you think that Toyota will dominate the EV market? Can they turn the ship around or is it too little too late? Submit your answer and leave a comment. You can go to patreon.com slash EV resource. That is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Or you can just click the link in the show notes. Again, a reminder that you do not have to be a Patreon supporter to participate. This is open to the public. All right, before we end the episode, I have a couple of announcements and requests. I want to thank our Patreon family for their support, especially to Rajiv Narayan at the director tier and Christopher Lawrence and Andy Cooper at the executive producer tier. Our monthly water cooler chat just finished a little bit ago, and we had a great conversation that touched on Tesla's holiday update, which I haven't gotten yet, uh, FSD situations, driving with full self-driving and what that's like, uh, winter driving, because of course tis the season, VinFast, and much more. It was recorded, and I posted it to the Patreon page, so if you want to see what you've missed and get in on all the fun, definitely check it out, patreon.com slash EV resource. Tiers start at just five Five dollars a month, and in addition to ad free episodes of the podcast, there are a bunch of other benefits included with supporting. So, what are you waiting for? Come join the family. If you enjoy the podcast, chances are that people that you know will enjoy it too. In addition to sharing it with them, I encourage you, please, I ask kindly to leave a review, whether that's on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts or whatnot. Um, I use Apple Podcasts. I know it's super easy. I don't know about the other platforms personally, but I'm going to assume it would be just as easy. So if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to go and leave a review, whatever you think, good, bad, otherwise, um, you know, it helps when other people are searching for EV related content, they can find it a lot easier that way. 
If you want to listen to any of the previous podcast shows, you can find them on the webpage under the podcast section and on all of the best podcast platforms. And if you're looking for more EV resource content, I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel as well as sign up for the monthly digital magazine. Uh, this month actually has been very focused on the Genesis GV60 performance. So uh, text and photos in the magazine. And then of course for YouTube, a video that is a performance review, including quarter mile time, zero to 60, and of the hot lap around Dominion Raceway's road course. So if you're interested in that vehicle, I really, really want you to go check it out because I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, I have started to amass a collection of products and companies that I believe offer something beneficial for you all. I am going to add a page on the webpage that will have all of the referral links, the discount codes and descriptions for everything on there. So I'm not going to read it out on the podcast anymore. Um, I was going to, and I've changed my mind. So uh, keep an eye out for that, or just look at the show notes for uh, links related to something that you might be interested in that could help. Uh, yeah, so that'll be all. I invite your feedback via email to hello at ev-resource.com, and I will catch you all next week. Thanks so much for listening.